Hey everybody, fascinating chat today as we dive into the world of enterprise AI through open source with a true innovator and expert in the field at Anaconda AI. Peter, how are you? I'm great, great, uh, glad to be here. Well, thanks for being here. Really intrigued by the work you and your team are doing. Before that, maybe introductions about your background and mission and how did you end up at Anaconda? What drew you to this very exciting space? Uh, yeah, it's it's a very interesting story. I didn't set out this way. I was a consultant using Python and its early stage scientific tools back in the aughts. And uh, we started seeing these tools getting used more and more in industry beyond just science. Uh, and my co-founder, Travis Olivant and I had the bright idea that maybe these uh, scientific tools are ready to cross over to the mainstream of business data analytics. And so we started Anaconda at the same time that we started a general community movement pushing the use of Python for data science and the open data science movement around Python. We really um, uh, were seminal in, in, in creating, leading that in the 2012 timeframe. Uh, and of course, as, as the years have rolled forward, we've seen that our hunch was correct. Many people do enjoy using Python um, for machine learning, for data analysis. And now, of course, it's become the language for AI. And we're very, very happy to see it's, it's a massive success. Well, let's talk about that. Take a little walk down memory lane. Python has been around forever, it seems, but it's now powering the AI boom. Um, did you see that coming when Anaconda got started? How did um, how did that evolve over time? It's funny because the answer to that question is both emphatically yes and like totally no. <laughs> we absolutely had a very very deep conviction that coming off the the the, the big data sort of boom right in the early 2010s. Uh, between big data and cloud computing, a lot more people are going to want to do a lot more things with their data besides just a SQL database query. Um, and they needed tools to do that, that were, that you know, Python was a great tool for doing that. R was also around, but Python, I think, had some advantages. And so we utterly believed that Python could be the language for data science, data analysis, machine learning at scale. So on that front, we were, yeah, I think we were right. And we, we definitely saw that coming. Um, but on the other hand, to be able to see that diffusion models and transformers and all these things would lead to this like massive portal to God knows what, right? That we did not see coming. I don't think anyone at that time could have seen it coming necessarily because AI was still in kind of the AI winter. Deep learning was starting to show some early traction and it wasn't until the late 20 teens when it was obvious that the AI revolution was here and Python was the language that was being, was preferred by the researchers and by, by uh, practitioners. Got it. And fast forward, you just launched uh, the Anaconda AI platform. So congrats on that. Thank so you. So for the viewers, what is it exactly? What makes it different from other AI or data platforms out there in the market? Yeah, we've always been up meeting users where they are, right? And so I think there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of energy around this space. A lot of people trying to do a lot of various kinds of things. For us, it's all about, okay, what are people actually doing, right? A lot of the data exploration, a lot of data transformation, all that stuff is still a precursor to doing AI at scale. And so you still need the classic, I would say, uh, Python, data, ML engineering, data engineering kinds of tools. But in addition to that, you also need a, you need a few other things, right? Um, and that includes things like model management. That includes things like, hey, how do I govern all these open source models that people are releasing, quantizations, fine tunes? I want to pull all of that into an enterprise ready platform. And so the practitioners have an easy place to collaborate, to share their work, to, to sort of party on the data and party on the models. But enterprises have real concerns around governance, compliance, reproducibility, all of these things. And the Anaconda AI platform is a place to bring both of these things together. So as a essentially an, an outgrowth and extension of what we've always done with our data science platform, uh, we make it easy for practitioners to continue using the tools they want to use. We're not super opinionated about do you want to use a Jupyter Notebook? Do you want to use VS Code? Whatever front ends and whatever cloud. We connect to all the clouds. We work on-prem and you know all these kinds of like hard security and regulated environments. But at the same time, when you start bringing in your, your, your AI models and you start building workloads around them, easily deploying them and giving administrators and IT folks a single pane of glass to see you know, in what ways do we have a security vulnerability? In what ways might we have some exposure here and there? Those are the kinds of things that we've wrapped up into uh, a single pane of glass, so to speak. Well done. You mentioned security. Security always comes up in open source discussion. What makes uh, you think it makes some companies or enterprises nervous? And how are you and you know the rest of the industry tackling that? 
Yeah, the the topic of open source security in just traditional straight up software development is becoming more and more uh, a center of focus, right? Because of the success of adoption of open source, I would say. But but um, but we've also seen some really new kinds of like very audacious attacks, deep two year, three year like sleeper mm. cell kind of attacks on the supply wow. chain, which is incredible. You know, the, the LibXZ attack that happened um, uh, last year, but but that came to light, I guess it happened for years and then it came to light last year. That was a very deep state level actor attacking the very nature and the fabric of what makes open source work. The trust model between open source collaborators was under attack. So we, we know that enterprises build on this stuff. We know that there are red team, black hat adversaries looking to, to weaponize that adoption. So as an industry, we have to get more serious about this adoption. And it's not just because we want to, there are regulatory things coming down from like Europe and also you know, uh, executive orders and guidances from NIST here in the United States. People have got to get serious about the software supply chain for open source software security. And now that is one thing. And when you look at AI, that's a whole additional set of complications on top of that, because all this AI stuff is built on top of, and to some extent uses this open source software stuff, but it, it introduces its own new set of complexities and, uh, and security vulnerabilities, right? A lot of it right now, when we look at um, real world, like no kidding, who's really doing AI stuff for real, for all the talk of agents and all this, you know, all the hype around the VC space and this stuff, what are people really doing? And when you look at the actual data, people are really having, they're struggling to get these things working in production for real, uh, not only because of just the challenges of the technology itself, hallucinations and, uh, and just efficacy and general reproducibility. So figuring out that is hard. But then additionally, we're seeing people already, again, Black Hat, Red Team, they're attacking those kinds of open models, people using tools. They're trying to jailbreak the system prompts. These things are vulnerable sort of like from the get-go. And so if you're an enterprise that is excited about the opportunity, as, as you should be, because I think it's massive, you also have to understand that security goes part and parcel with the development of this. This is not like an open source development. Oh, we'd like to secure our Python or Node.js packages. Wouldn't that be nice if we were checking all the boxes? With the AI stuff, it is not optional. The guardrails are just not optional given the scale and scope and complexity of what is happening there and what that tooling actually represents. Well said, things are certainly moving fast. And, you know, month to month, week to week, how are you seeing any major shifts in how companies are building AI solutions today, their approaches? I mean, what's working, what's still broken? Yeah, it, it does, you're right, it changes week to week sometimes, but mostly <laughs> it's still a month to month cadence, right? <laughs> uh, we had for a while, a lot of people just trying to get bigger, bigger context so they could one shot everything. Then they realized that ah, that kind of falls apart. It's kind of like, you know, hit or miss. And so then coupling these systems up with, uh, with RAG, RAG became all the rage, right? And then now it's agents and agentic workflows. And now it's all these things combined together, right? Can they use tools? Can we have, uh, can we do chain of thought? So we're doing inference time scaling. Um, you know, all of these things are now all coming together. Um, so uh, that's my view of like, whatever, the last 18 months in like 30 seconds. But mm -hmm. um I, I think where what's nice is that uh, it feels that to me, the vibe seems to be that people are starting to ask the hard questions. Like if we want to use this as a, a reproducible engineering discipline, we build things that work. We know they work. We turn them on tomorrow. They work again tomorrow. Like if we want to build that on top of these stochastic uh, and probabilistic sort of components, these squishy soft components, how do we actually do that? And so more and more of the conversations that I feel like I'm having with people, they are looking at that problem and not having wishful thinking, not just being like, okay, well, some new paper at least next week is going to solve it all for us. I think people have kind of given up on that a little bit. People are starting to understand to actually deploy LLM, AI technology um, at an enterprise grade level, you have to be extremely thoughtful about each piece of it. You have to do the evaluations. All the magic is actually in the evals. And you know whether you build your own framework, whether you use one of the existing ones that are out there, uh, there is no silver bullet. I think the sort of the evaporation of the silver bullet might be the biggest vibe shift over the last year. That it's not just rag, it's not just agents, it's not just chain of thought. It's a lot of these things being put together thoughtfully, and then a thoughtful enterprise-specific, domain and problem-specific set of evaluations. There's not a shortcut to it. So I think that's kind of where I'm, I'm glad to see the industry conversation maturing 
around that? Because that I think is the the high integrity thing to do. Oh, such a great insight. And as you look for opportunities for improvement in the AI developer workflow right now, obviously you're focused on tooling. Where do, do we need improvement if you were to do a SWOT analysis? Is it tooling, of course, but process, mindset, training, other things? <laughs> yes to all of them. Sorry, that's sort of a cop-out answer. But that is, uh, it's it's all of these. I, I guess the thing is, um, what I would, maybe as a metaphor, we use metaphor, right? If we're moving from like the 19... 20s and 30s and you've got cars and we know how to drive cars and there's some safety that you need to put around cars that's maybe traditional software development and then we move to jet airplanes that go like mach 0 0.9 0 0.95 you have to do all the things but better right your manufacturing tolerances have to get lower your pilot training has to get better the infrastructure you build the, the runways have to be much much smoother than just some crappy little country road right the tires have to be high quality rubber or they explode when you land like all these things, it's unfortunately, yes. But if you get all that right, wow, you can hurl 300 people through the air at the speed of sound, right? So there is a benefit to it, but it's not just going to be like, just turn the crank and now it's easy. I don't think there's an easy mode. There's an easy mode to deceiving yourself that you're doing something interesting. To do actually something correct is not going to be an easy mode. It requires upgrading all of these things. And actually the hardest thing isn't the technology, the tooling. It is, I think, the mindsets. I think it's setting executive and other stakeholder expectation. And that's not something that's something on us as an industry uh, to, to sort of level set, right? And that's where conversations like this, I think, hopefully can have some kind of impact where people can say, okay, everyone else is also struggling. It's not just me. We don't really just suck uniquely. Everyone's struggling with this, right? Fantastic thought there. So there's a lot of, you know, discussion uh, controversy occasionally around AI models built behind mm -hmm. closed doors. Uh, right. Do you think the closed source, as if if you call it that, AI approach is a threat to innovation, or is this just the way business gets done? Uh, do I have permission to speak freely here? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's up to you and your team. I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. With, yes. No, I, I think, look, it's... Um... It, it, I think it, I think it's going to follow the same cycle of technology innovation and adoption mm -hmm. as anything else, right? Uh, that certainly for people to garner the investment and to sustain investor enthusiasm, they have to tell a story about some proprietary advantage. Uh, and when you look at AI, well, it's either the data or it's the model or it's your people that know how to mm -hmm. train the data into a model. But the algorithms are all being published in papers that are widely available. The hardware you're doing it on is the same GPUs that Jensen is selling to everybody else. So it's not like you got a lock on the architecture of the hardware. Now, Google does have their own hardware. There's a lot of people making custom hardware. But for the most part, those are those are cost benefits. Those are not like a you know a quantum leap in capability of what an LLM does or what an AML does. So the question is like, if you didn't say that I have something closed source op that's opaque and that's of special value, you'd have some hard conversations from the investor side of the world. So I think they have, there is some motivated reasoning there. But if you think about this from the point of view of just uh, a machine learning expert or someone who's thinking about these things at a technical level, there's really no magic or secret sauce in this. Th there are techniques, of course, to get the most efficacy when you're training, to get it to converge, you know, loss curves. I get it. There's definitely real skill there but is it a hundred billion dollars of market cap worth of skill i don't think so right because we've seen many teams frontier teams in the world are always trading off the pole position and the leading position for their models which means that the smart people that openai has well anthropics got smart people too as does gemini as does <laughs> baidu like everyone's got smart people right so so the thing is okay in that case even if we say the closed source stuff has some special sauce, it looks like lots of people have the special sauce. And when we think about, okay, where does the data come from? Well, a lot of it's scraped off the open internet. A lot of it is public data. A lot of it is, you know, books and other things. Some of them are in the public domain. So I think in long term that a huge part of the value in an LLM is based on data that is in the commons or publicly available to everyone. So the baseline that should be publicly and generally freely available is going to be quite high. I don't think it's like you either get chat GPT or llama five or nothing. I think that the, the what's publicly available in the open is going to be pretty high, which means the commoditization pressure is going to be quite steep. It's going to be quite, quite high. And I think in the long run, I think the industry will have to trend towards transparency. 
Otherwise, I mean, you see the latest controversy with what's happening with Grok, right, over at XAI. Mm. You know, that's not tenable. We cannot have a customer support chatbot for medical care all of a sudden spewing anti-Semitic stuff because a patient's name mm. is like Feinberg. You cannot, you cannot have that. That's not the world we want to live in, right? So we have to have transparency. We have to demand accountability in how this technology gets built. Amazing. Well, that's quite a bike drop moment uh, <laughs> for this discussion. But I, I, I do have one more question. I mean, looking ahead, you're such an innovator. Where do you see the open source AI movement headed over the next couple of years? And what, what, what's your role in it? Yeah, so there's, there's, I, I think that it will become more apparent that the open source and transparent public and commons AI can be done and can be done competitively. I'm personally um, leading some efforts around that, and we'll see hopefully more of the, the announcements around some of that stuff here in the fall. Um, but there's a large number of people, nonprofits, governments, the UN, a lot of people who want to see this as a technology that belongs to everyone because it's based on the works of everyone. It's, you know, it's like, it's why would it belong to everyone? So that's something we're going to be driving pretty hard. But for open source in particular, and people trying to build viable businesses and businesses trying to adopt these things, I think we're going to see that um, the conversation will have to start really focusing on the supply chain, the data supply chain for these models. And we're going to have, have we're going to um, have to have much more focus on evaluations, on how to engineer safety around these kinds of probabilistic systems, uh, how we're going to ensure uh, when we put these sensors into drones, into you know autonomous vehicles or household robots and humanoid robots, those things cannot be opaque. There has to be a liability chain. There has to be you know, a place where societies and governments and regulators come in and say, these are acceptable, these are not acceptable, and we'll drive real accountability around that. So I think the role that open source has to play in this is that we can show you can do these things in an open and transparent and accountable way. And in that way, really, you know, just set the conversation so that there's not by default an expectation that these have to be black boxes. Oh, such a great insight. Uh, so you're in Austin, uh, your team is is everywhere. That's right. Um, a little bit of a quiet period here in the summer, but where can people meet you virtually in person, any uh, travel or events or meetups or otherwise in the next few weeks or Months. Yeah, we, we've got, have gone through the summer spate of conferences. I'll be at the mm -hmm. AI4 conference in Vegas mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning or the middle of August. Um, the Anaconda folks are around at a number of different kinds of conferences. Um, and uh, uh, coming up in the fall, you know, we'll be you know, all the major industry uh, AI conferences will plan to be there. So just look for the Anaconda booth, come by, talk to us. Love to talk to people about our AI platform, how we help enterprises do AI in a responsible, governed uh, way. And I'm also happy to chat with anyone who wants to talk more about open source and open source AI. A wonderful mission. Uh, congratulations on the success. Onwards and upwards. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Evan. And thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. And be sure to check out our new TV show, techimpact.tv, now in Fox Business and Bloomberg. Take care.